What should you do if strengthening exercises aren't helping for proximal hamstring tendinopathy? Proximal hamstring tendinopathy is an overload condition, meaning that the loads placed on the tendon have exceeded what it can tolerate, leading to the pain. The load is a combination of compressive loading, which is where the tendon presses against the ischial tuberosity, along with tensile loading, which is where the load is along the tendon. And when we look at rehab, rehab's goal is to build up the strength of the tendon so that it can tolerate those loads. However, strength and overload are only one part of what makes up pain. So in this video, we're going to start off by discussing chronic pain and then go into some factors that can impact both pain and the rehab approach for proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Plus, it is a personalized experience influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors. Altogether, pain is a protective mechanism to actual or potential tissue damage. And when looking at the treatment for proximal hamstring tendinopathy, the focus is heavily on that biological part. A fairly standard treatment approach would be to do a physical exam, maybe get an MRI to see the structure of the tendon, and then do strengthening exercises to help build up the tolerance of the tendon to load and to improve the structure. But this approach really doesn't address the psychological or the social factors that might be contributing to pain. And these factors actually might play a pretty big role in limiting recovery with chronic proximal hamstring tendinopathy. One way to think about this is by using this cup. And we can have a certain pain threshold here, which is the amount of load that the tendon can tolerate. So as long as we're below that threshold, we're okay. However, as we continue to load, we can eventually go past that threshold and then we can experience pain. And so for treatment, we can either try to reduce the amount of load that we're placing on the tendon, or we can try to increase that pain threshold. But sometimes there's other factors already in the cup, which is going to decrease the amount of space that we have. And so as we start to load, it's easier to exceed that pain threshold leading to pain. And there's many factors that can already be in the cup, but in this video, we're going to discuss stress and sleep. Potentially the best way to see how stress can impact pain is by using the fear avoidance model to explain it. In the fear avoidance model, we will start with the tendon and some sort of event that leads to actual or potential damage to the tendon. And then stress can modify this intensity of the pain generation as a protective mechanism to this actual or potential damage. This is the reason why if you pinch yourself, the pain is much more tolerable than if somebody else pinches you or if you pinch yourself unexpectedly in a door or something. Then we can move down to where the fear avoidance model splits. On one side we see recovery and on the other side we see fear avoidance. And again, stress can influence which direction we go. Normally this protective mechanism reduces and we head over to recovery. However, if there's sufficient stress, the protective mechanism remains in place since the threat hasn't been removed and we go back into the cycle and this can be further reinforced, which then limits the recovery. When looking at the response to exercise, for example, this is a really important factor. Instead of exercise building up tolerance to movement and us heading over into recovery, the increased stress limits that ability and keeps us in that fear avoidance cycle with pain. This means that we need to address the stressor to improve the effectiveness of our exercise-based rehab program. And obviously the way that we address the stressor really depends on what is going on. Adding some stress management strategies can be a useful place to start. Either meditation or some mindfulness exercises can be helpful to decrease some of that generalized stress. Another option is to go for a walk, especially outdoors, which can provide some benefit. Obviously, the best approach is probably to see a mental health therapist who can give you an individualized plan specific to whatever your needs are to help to decrease that stress level. Sleep is another important factor, not only for persistent pain, but also for just overall health. With reduced sleep, there are several changes that impact pain. For example, the systems that help to reduce pain, such as the opioid system, tend to become less responsive. And then there's increased activity from the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system, which produces cortisol, and the immune system, which then produces inflammatory chemicals, both of which will increase pain sensitivity. So essentially we have a decrease in systems that reduce pain and an increase in systems that increase pain. And this relationship between pain and sleep goes both ways. So pain can interfere with the ability to sleep comfortably, just as reduced sleep can increase pain sensitivity, which really creates a pretty vicious loop. And the good news is that there's multiple strategies that we can use to help improve sleep with chronic pain. Sleep hygiene is the term used to describe these strategies to help to improve sleep. Some of these strategies include setting a sleep schedule to make sure that we're going to sleep and waking up around the same time every day. 
that 30 to 60 minutes before going to bed that we're not using electronics and if we can in that time actually finding some sort of activity that helps to kind of calm us down to get us ready for bed and then also just making sure that the room is comfortable for sleep, that it's a cold and dark room. And if improving our sleep hygiene doesn't seem to be making a difference in improving our sleep and we're still having difficulty, then we can do cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is another effective treatment option for improving our sleep. The key to all of these strategies is to reduce the factors that are contributing to chronic proximal hamstring tendinopathy. And we don't necessarily need all of these things to be perfect but small improvements in sleep and stress and all those other factors can actually make large improvements when we're looking at the treatment of proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Plus, they can actually make our rehab approach when we're looking at exercises much more effective.